Boeing's unionized workers are on strike. Marketplace Morning Report is supported by Schwab. Schwab offers investors choices like full-service wealth management, self-directed investing options, and trading on think or swim. More at schwab.com. For Marketplace in Los Angeles, I'm Nova Safo in for David Brancaccio. The Boeing story in a moment. First, some 14 million people in the South have been under flood watches from Francine, which made landfall in Louisiana as a Category 2 hurricane on Wednesday. The slow-moving storm is dumping huge amounts of rain, and the National Weather Service forecasts that it will continue to do so through Saturday, posing flooding risks. But it's likely very few homeowners along the storm's path have flood insurance. As Marketplace's Samantha Fields reports, that coverage gap is also an awareness gap. Regular homeowners insurance does not cover flood damage. But Mark Friedlander at the Nonprofit Insurance Information Institute says a lot of people don't realize that. Flood and earthquake are always excluded from a standard home insurance policy. Those are two types of coverage you always need to purchase separately. But he says nationally, just 6% of homeowners have flood insurance, and most who do are required to because they live in a federally designated flood zone and have a mortgage. Very few homeowners purchase flood insurance voluntarily. It's a huge insurance gap, also a huge knowledge gap. But Don Griffin at the American Property Casualty Insurance Association says even when agents make it clear that regular policies don't cover flooding, most people just don't think it's going to happen to them, and it's an extra cost that's uh, six, $700 on average a year. That often doesn't feel worth it. And Amy Bach at the nonprofit United Policyholders says for many, it's just too expensive. People also tend to assume that FEMA will make them whole, which is not the case. We on the consumer advocacy side really struggle to be able to alert consumers in a way that it's going to register. But she says the issue is bigger than just raising awareness. We've got to develop an all-risk product that will provide some basic protection against the full gamut of disasters. And not require people to piece together coverage themselves. I'm Samantha Fields for Marketplace. More than 30,000 Boeing workers have walked off the job. Last night, they voted almost unanimously to strike. The work stoppage affects Boeing facilities in the Seattle area, as well as in Portland, Oregon, and Southern California. Marketplace's Nancy Marshall Genzer has the details. 96% of the machinists at these Boeing factories voted to strike. They're members of the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers. They want more money. Boeing offered them a 25% raise over four years. The union wanted a 40% pay hike, plus changes in pension benefits. Boeing also said it would build its next plane at a unionized plant. The union says it'll now regroup and plan its next steps as members walk picket lines. Boeing says it's ready to get back to the negotiating table to reach a new agreement. The company says it wants to reset its relationship with its workers. The strike comes at a tough time for Boeing. It's 7.30. Seven Max jet was grounded after two fatal crashes. It's flying again and production on new Maxes has resumed, but there are still problems. A door plug blew off an Alaska Airlines 737 Max last January. Now deliveries of new Maxes to airlines will be delayed because of the strike. I'm Nancy Marshall Genzer for Marketplace. Let's do the numbers. Markets in Asia were mixed. Japan's Nikkei fell 7 tenths percent. Hong Kong's Hang Seng index rose 8 tenths percent. In pre-market trading on Wall Street, Dow, S&P and Nasdaq futures are up in the 1 to 2 tenths percent range. The 10-year Treasury yield is down at 3.651 percent. Shares of Navient, formerly Sally May, rose more than 5% yesterday, despite news that the federal government has proposed banning the company from servicing federal student loans. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau says Navient failed to adequately help some students who were struggling with repayment and made processing errors. Navient said it disagreed with the CFPB's conclusions, but did agree to a $120 million settlement. Marketplace Morning Report is supported by Amazon Business, aiming to help save time by offering smart business buying solutions so there's more time to focus on growing the business and less time doing the admin. More at AmazonBusiness.com. And by Clear Channel Outdoor, offering a nationwide network of billboards and data solutions that help businesses build brand awareness and influence consumer behavior. Billboardsforbusiness.com. 
About 43 million Americans lived in poverty last year, according to new figures from the Census Bureau. The nation's poverty rate was nearly 13 percent if you account for things such as geographic differences and the cost of living. The rate rose despite better economic growth overall. Marketplace's Matt Levin explains why. Typically, poverty rates fall during periods of economic growth in a hot labor market. And with unemployment at historically low levels in 2023, lower income workers did see wage gains. The problem, though, for many poor families, inflation. So essentially, when the costs of things go up, that reduces the amount of money that people have in their pockets at the end of the day. Michael Collins is a poverty researcher at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. The biggest driver of the higher poverty rate is also the source of inflation the Fed has struggled with the most. Rent is more expensive, and so rent took away more money out of people's budgets, and so as a result, they had less money left over for everything else. And while rents were escalating, many families saw pandemic-era government programs expire, like expanded food stamp and free school lunch benefits. Bradley Hardy is a professor of public policy at Georgetown. That's a meaningful contributor to this uptick in, in child poverty. An uptick to the tune of nearly 14 percent. Back in 2021, only about 5 percent of children lived in poverty, mostly because of a brief expansion in the child tax credit. Congress let it expire after one year. Hardy says restoring that credit would have a profound impact. There's quite a bit of evidence that providing economic security, lowering levels of economic hardship, lowering poverty can have long run economic returns for the kids who are growing up in those households. The credit was pretty popular with Americans across party lines, which may be why Democratic presidential nominee Kamala Harris and GOP vice presidential nominee J.D. Vance have both expressed support for bringing it back. I'm Matt Levin for Marketplace. Our executive producer is Kelly Silvera. Our digital producer is Dylan Mietnan. Our engineers are Brian Allison, John Brewington, and Jessen Dooler. I'm Nova Safo with a Marketplace Morning Report. From APM, American Public Media.